broadcasting from Studio 202 at the Springit Technology Center in Navasota, Texas. It's NOV Live. Now, here's your host, Michael Gaines. Hello and welcome to NOV Live. It is Wednesday, December 1st, 2021. I'm Michael Gaines and glad you're joining us today as we continue our ongoing conversation bringing you technical insights and experts in the world of energy and what that is doing for the world around us. So thanks for joining us. Today we're talking about a topic that uh, impacts all of us, and that is talking about uh, greenhouse gases, uh, what they are, how they impact us, and what we're doing about it. So we have an expert that will share some perspective and, as always, take your questions in our show today. So before we kick off and greet our guest, I would like to uh, greet Shelby Dumaine mm -hmm. uh, at our social media desk. So a happy December 1st to you. <laughs> I don't know if you can believe it's already here, but here we are. Oh, oh my gosh. I'm so excited. I'm loving already all the decorations yep. and the lights everywhere. It's it's the best time of the year. That's right. There you go. But, um, thank you, Michael. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining the show today. If you're um, tuning in for the first time or maybe you're a longtime viewer of the show, we welcome you. And right off the bat, I like to ask, where are you watching from? Go ahead and let us know down below in the comment section, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Um, you can leave uh, the, where, you're, where you're watching from, but you can also leave any questions you have for our guest today there as well. At the end of the episode, we're going to do a live Q&A. So any questions you leave have the potential to be featured on the show um, there in that live Q&A section. And uh, if later on you have any more questions about the show, you can find those answers and contact us at socialmedia at NOV.com. Um, that's the best place to reach us with any questions or maybe even ideas for, for future topics. And, uh, you know, I always also like to promote if you would like to watch any past episodes and see what we have talked about before, you can find all of those at NOV.com slash live so that's on the screen now but you can go there we have a search feature on there now too so you can search keywords or maybe guests that you uh, want to know if we've had on or find you can see all of those episodes there so um, that's how you can find us that way but as far as today if you have any questions go ahead and comment those below and before i send it back to michael uh, it's now time for one of my favorite parts of the week where i ask you a question it's time for the rig geek post of the week Rig Geeks Post of the Week. All right. And for those who maybe it's your first time watching, this is where I'm going to ask you a trivia question. If you think you know the answer to the question, go ahead and comment it below. And at the end of the episode, after we do that Q&A, we're going to reveal the answer. So again, if you think you know it, uh, go ahead and comment it. And we'll have the question here on the screen. This week, we're asking you, what is the name of the female scientist who predicted the effects of greenhouse gas? So if you think you know uh, her name, go ahead and let us know. Put that comment below. And again, we will reveal at the end of the show. So I'll see you then. In the meantime, I'll see you online. Um, but I'll be back to get your questions answered in just a little bit. All right, Shelby. Home. And this, this wasn't a trick question. It's not, not you, right? Is it? <laughs> no, okay. definitely not. I can All say right. it's not. <laughs> well, I, I, that was my first guess, but okay. All right. Well, looking forward to getting that uh, in a little bit. Thanks, Shelby. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are going to jump into our conversation today, again, talking about uh, greenhouse gases and getting some insight into uh, this, uh, this, this item that really impacts all of us. Of course, uh, we're all here on Earth and share this space and so want to uh, be able to learn and understand more, uh, not only about, uh, about the impact, but what we can do both as individuals and as organizations to make a positive difference. So with me today, I have the pleasure uh, of speaking with a good friend, uh, Mr. Spencer Ullman, who is the Director of Innovation within the PFT or, or Process and Flow Technologies uh, group here at NOV. So Spencer, always good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So we're, uh, you know, here on NOV Live, we always like to start at the ground floor and, and never want to assume that someone, you know, has a deep understanding of a, of a topic. And, um, 
you know, I've, I've learned over my career, as I'm sure you have, you know, when you hear phrases and concepts uh, around you, sometimes it can be easy just to nod your head and keep keep walking. Uh, but, uh, but I think for the purposes of our conversation today, we're going to maybe pause and just assume for the sake of our conversation that maybe folks have heard phrases, but maybe not uh, have, have met, haven't had the opportunity to dive in. So maybe we'll we'll just start and talk about the, the basics. So what is a, a greenhouse gas? How do you describe that? Sure, and from a simple answer standpoint, a greenhouse gas is anything that promotes the greenhouse effect. And that leads into another question, which is what's the greenhouse effect? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we've got kind of a simple uh, animation here to kind of emphasize what this is. But if you think about the Earth as we have solar radiation coming from the sun that comes through our atmosphere. And the atmosphere will allow some of that radiation to come in the upper atmospheres will reflect some of it, but most of that comes down to the Earth's surface. Um, and then the Earth's surface is, even on here, you can see the you know, North America there and, and the ocean. A certain amount of that light is reflected back, a certain amount is accepted um, and absorbed in through plants, water, other entities, and physical objects on Earth. Um, the amount that is reflected back is essentially captured in these greenhouse gases and the energy is withheld within the atmosphere. So what that means is that when there's more greenhouse gases, there's more heat captured, and that in turn leads into a higher energy state. It also leads into more heat that's uh, left within the, the atmosphere that we live in. So that's kind of the, the basis of what uh, greenhouse gas is, how it affects the, the atmosphere and the earth we live on as well. Mm. And uh, so when you're, you're looking at greenhouse gases, uh, by its very nature and, and the phraseology, it's plural. So it's not you know, a single gas, it's a, a, a mixture of gases. So, so can you talk a little bit about that? What, is, what does that mixture look like? Sure, and that's the thing is that greenhouse gases, you say there's, there's several of them. And I put the majority ones up here. The, the number one most prevalent gas that is considered greenhouse gas is CO2, carbon mm -hmm. dioxide. Um, that makes up about 80% of the composition of the atmospheric greenhouse gases. The second one to that is methane, and that holds about 10%. Uh, the next one down from that is nitrous oxide, and then the, the smaller component on here is the uh, fluorinated gases, uh, so CFCs, uh, fluorinated hydrocarbons, and things like that as well. Um, where those come from, there's a different basis. Um, kind of on the, if you can see the infographic here, transportation makes up the big part of that. It's the cars we drive, it's the ships that are carrying cargo around, it's the trucks that are moving things around. Uh, electricity generation uh, for power uh, generation, um, industry, agriculture, commercial, residential. It's a wide mix of where it comes from. It's also a wide mix of what's being uh, uh, put into the atmosphere from those different sources as well. Mm -hmm. So we, you, you helped really in, in uh, just, just a, a few minutes here, probably distill some, some long conversations and lectures on, on what this is. And so we've you know, talked about you know, what greenhouse gases uh, are, maybe what that composition is as well. Uh, what we haven't talked about yet, which I think uh, gets, gets a lot of attention, of course, is the impact that those gases have on, on the planet and the environment. Correct, and, and the impact is dependent upon the gas we're talking about. So CO2 is the common reference point that most people will see. Um, it, there's a lot of acronyms out there, GHG, which stands for greenhouse gas. Um, there's CO2E, which is CO2 equivalents. So for talking purposes, when we talk about the greenhouse gas as far as how much energy they're accept accepting from that that is uh, bounced off the earth, CO2 is what we call one. So if you kind of think of uh, like sunscreen, you know, SPF. SPF 10 means that more light's coming through than SPF 30 or 200 or other. Mm. Um, in this case, higher numbers are bad. So CO2 is one. A methane would be uh, 28 uh, on a 100-year cycle. It's actually higher on a shorter-term cycle. Um, nitrous oxide is several hundred. Uh, so relative to a molecule of CO2, methane is 28 times. So one molecule of methane essentially equates to 28 molecules of CO2. Uh, one molecule of nitrous oxide, um, that from whipping cream or other types of sources for medical purposes and things like that, are equivalent to 300 molecules of CO2. Uh, when you start talking about fluorinated gases, it can be several hundred to several thousand times uh, more impactful than one molecule of, of uh, CO2. So the, the bigger question that keeps coming up, and 
I'm going to try to avoid religion, politics. Uh, I'm going to try to talk science. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, the bigger question that comes up is how does that impact us? What is it doing to our climate, and, and, and why is there so much focus on that? And it's not an easy answer, uh, and that's part of the reason why there's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of uh, active uh, discussions, um, some good information, some bad information. Um, if we go to the next uh, chart here, some of that challenge comes back to just the science alone. When you're looking back several million years to try to understand prior uh, climate, prior ocean levels, prior uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere, the science is plagued by air. As you have the air as far as how it's being uh, captured, the sample itself, where the sample's coming from, dating the samples, all those things come back into some uh, basis of, of scientific error that, that's being uh, taken forward. Um, what we do know is there have been periods in the past, and not several hundred years, but several thousand, several million years, where the atmospheric CO2 levels were at elevated levels and uh, temperatures were at elevated levels. You know, where and exactly what point in time, that's still somewhat debatable. Uh, but the science is there showing that when CO2 levels increase, that coincided with increases in temperatures and other geological events, uh, weather and, and things like that as well. Uh, sea level as well uh, is one of the big ones there. Um, but if we look back to where we are right now, if you go back one for one more second, if you look back when we've been where we are right now, it was somewhere three to eight million years ago where sea levels were 15 to 25 meters higher, uh, global temperatures were two to five degrees C hotter. Um, and those don't, you know, the sea level, if you're living next to the ocean, means a lot to you. Um, if you're inland 15 meters, what does that mean? Maybe not that much, but until you start looking at all the civilization that is uh, surrounding the ocean levels, it means a lot. Uh, same thing with temperatures, is two to five degrees C, call it four to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, in a summer day in Houston when it's 90 degrees and people are complaining about how hot it is, yeah, another 10 degrees, it's hotter. Uh, it's still survivable. But when you start talking about populations where it's maybe already 100 degrees and they're already having issues with drought and things like that, 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees C means a big difference on uh, survivability, uh, just general health and population concern concerns there. Um, so. Somewhere in that ballpark, um, you know, no humans were alive at that point when the conditions were there. And then if we look kind of more, more midterm in the historical sense, looking back 800,000 years, there were a couple points where we were in the 300 ppm. There were several points where there were rapid increases and rapid decreases. However, they were over several thousand years rather than over several hundred years. And use this chart to kind of show on the far right-hand side that dashed line showing where 2020 average of 412 ppm. We didn't just go from 250, 275 to 400 ppm in the matter of a few years. That took several hundred years. But relative to all the other trends that were shown on here is we've accelerated thousands of years into a couple hundred years. And we go one level deeper in here, we can actually look at the last 170 years and this chart's particularly interesting because it's kind of what I'd like to say is what we know of as humanity today is where and how people lived in 1750s. Yes, we didn't have cars, but we still ate, we still had houses, we still had you know dwellings and things like that. So it's kind of normal, um, current day, what you think of as of human life. Um, but between 1750 and the late 1800s, there's quite a bit of population growth. Uh, there's a fair amount of um, changes in technology. The Industrial Revolution starts to take place, uh, more widespread access to uh, living standards that we would c consider kind of everyday life today, clothes, shoes, mm -hmm. normal things like that. And then into the late 1800s, into the mid-1900s, is we're really talking about the fossil fuel uh, proliferation across the globe. And that's where we start to see not only the emissions, but also the uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, to start to really increase there. But it's population, it's fuel usage, and it's emissions overall. It's not just one thing that, that plays into that. Um, and then the last part of that chart is that the, the really accelerated curve there is it's the widespread proliferation. It's the population, mm -hmm. and it's really, it's, it's cars weren't that 
they didn't exist in the early 1800s. So things that are available to us today are much more widespread and, right. and consumer products and things as well. So the impacts are somewhat loose in terms of exactly what's going to happen, but it's very clear that we have done some things differently over the last 170 years where we've basically undone the last several hundred mm -hmm. million years of dinosaurs and plankton and plants getting put in the ground, and we're taking them out of the ground. Right, right. So, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at um, these types of... Uh, uh, this type of data and you come to the conclusion, okay, you know, I'm, I, I see, you know, the, the information, I'm, I'm, I'm processing that. Of course, the next step, at least in my mind, is, okay, now that I know this, you know, what is it that we need to do? And, of course, we can be broken down in, in, into many, many ways, you know, individual exactly. organizations, things like that. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a piece that you and I can do on our own. Uh, there's pieces that require much more concerted efforts uh, amongst foundations, corporations, governments, um, the world overall as well. Um, and when you talk about greenhouse gases and emissions, these aren't just change a few knobs and it's easy. Um, when you really look at the impacts of what we're talking about here, it's the closest I can kind of think of as a, you know, an overall earth response to something has been kind of like the pandemic where it requires almost every single country every single individual understanding it knowing how to mm. how to handle it and active uh, regulations to support that as well mm. um, this isn't the first time we've you know talked about greenhouse gases um, there's other there's other conversations in the past about ozone um, which kind of took and converted Instead of CFCs, we moved to hydronated fluorocarbons. So we went away from the chlorinated fluor, uh, hydrocarbons with uh, fluorine and moved into something, uh, you know, kind of a lesser evil. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a lot of what we see over the next few years where we start looking at what we as individuals can do, kind of how we operate, you know, our household, our, our family, what we're doing. Are we uh, just flying everywhere in the world? Are we starting to do things more local? Are we driving uh, 1960 sports cars with six mile per gallon uh, average uh, fuel consumption? Or are we starting to look more on the hybrids and electric vehicles, which are somewhere in the, the 30 to several hundred miles per gallon equivalent basis like that? Um, and then there's also where you get your power from. Um, and some parts of the world don't really have the opportunity to source from different locations. Um, in the US, especially in Texas, we have the ability to decide where we actually get our power from. Um, you can go for the cheapest kilowatt hour, or you can actually start looking at renewable sources, and you know, whether it's a, a Green Mountain Energy or a, a Chariot or somebody else out there that's actually providing 100% renewable. We have the ability to, to do that. Mm. Um, not everybody in the world does, though. Right. Um, and then the last one is kind of what you bring in and what you put out, you know, where you're getting your clothes from, where you're getting your products from. Um, if you're operating a small business or, you know, where you're putting your energy into of, of uh, products and things like that as well. So mm. kind of three categories. And there's sources out there uh, kind of talk in general as far as a carbon footprint. Uh, some people may know what that is. If you don't, Google it, uh, look it up. There's definitely some good sources out there to understand what it means. Uh, there's calculators out there you can use to look into what you do, how that impacts, and also looking at references mm. for uh, how you compare it to the rest of the world as well. And I, and I think that's really good because, you know, the, the, maybe some of the, the conversations that you might, uh, I would say, unfortunately stumble upon, especially in, a, in an online discourse, which I don't even, many times I don't use the word discourse because a lot of times it's just more, you know, kind of grenade lobbying, but but you'll have these extremes that says, oh, well, you know, you know, people are saying that you should never fly. And, they should, and it's like, well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a love, there's a middle ground there, I think, with, with most things where it's, okay, well, how are we looking at, you know, some of those, um, the, the uses of resources and, you know, is there an alternative? I, I don't know that using infinitives is necessarily, you know, always the, always the best route, right, play on words. But, but I think looking at ways that we can, mitigate um, our, our impact is, is always helpful because the, the challenge is thinking that it's, it's all on one person, right? It's just, I, and I, I, can't, I can't reduce myself anymore. You know, you might be living out you know, in a tent and you use a solar pan. It's like, okay, well, what else can I do? But I think it's a collective, like you said earlier, when you have a collective that, that comes together, the, the, the order of magnitude of impact is, is really seen there. Yeah, and I, I liked your word there. Infinitives and definitives are both mm -hmm. very challenging when it comes to science and also human population. 
Um, if, if there's a mandate telling somebody what not to do, they'll find a way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and, and like your example of, you know, don't fly. Well, that's not really the message here is if you're flying, there's still options you could do as well. In fact, mm -hmm. most, uh, most airlines will allow you to buy carbon offsets to trade for the miles that you're using for that. Mm. Um, most of those go into forestry projects, go into uh, very well-defined conservative uh, uh, carbon sinks and, and things to, to counter some of the, the miles that might be driven mm -hmm. or, or flown like that. Um, and your reference of doing something is, when you look, at, or when you as an individual start looking online and start looking at your carbon footprint, most of the U.S. population is somewhere in the ballpark of eight to ten times higher uh, carbon footprint than what we're needing to do to try to meet the levels to, to maintain or to at least reduce the, uh, the future expectations for carbon emissions and, and get it back to something that the Earth can handle. Um, when you look at the rest of the world, it might be six to eight times. Um, I personally have gone through and looked at it. Um, purchasing renewable power, driving hybrid vehicles, having an efficient home, I'm still probably three to four times what we need to be. Um, and then getting it from that point down is you still need to eat. You still right. need to have a roof over your head. Right. You still need to do right. these other things. And there's good practices, but then there's starting to be kind of, at some point it gets painful. Um, and that's where it's going to start becoming challenging because there's still parts of the world that don't have electricity in their homes. They don't have uh, continuous supply of electricity as well. So there's a lot that goes in that as, as far as what an individual can do. And that kind of goes into the next part, which is more of what the uh, global uh, focus can be right. or individual company focuses. And that gets more on the ESG aspects of what we're doing for environmental and mm -hmm. sustainability and you know, overall governance and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. And kind of those same three focuses apply here where it's more the scope one which is in um, how a company operates, what they're doing, uh, what they have going out their stacks, what they have coming in, um, and how they're handling it type of thing. Uh, scope two is more in lines of, again, where you're getting energy from. And do you have solar panels on the roof? Are you getting power from uh, cleaner sources? Are you getting it from dirtier sources? And then the scope three is back into the lines of what comes in, your raw material supply, uh, what goes out the product supply. And that's the one that's challenging, especially in our industry, is if we're uh, supporting the production of oil and gas products, that's automatically a challenge when it comes to the, the scope three uh, emissions side. Uh, but when you bring it back into what we're countering uh, and you know, relative to, I'm gonna probably get some hate mail here for, for coal industry here, but it's like coal relative to natural gas. Well, it's all a comparison of what is the lesser of, uh, from an impact standpoint, from emissions perspective. And the other thing too is there's nothing wrong with methane, there's nothing wrong with coal, but you need to find a way to handle the output that comes from mm -hmm. it to not to continue to put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Right. Um, and that's where we're gonna get into some of the more interesting topics uh, here in a few minutes regarding the, the technologies that come right. about from the backside there. So for those that uh, have joined us in the last couple of minutes, we're talking with Mr. Spencer Ullman, who is the Director of Innovation within the PFT group here at NOV. And we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, uh, what that comprises, how it impacts us, and the technology that is being developed to uh, combat and uh, to otherwise help mitigate those uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So if you have questions for Spencer and uh, want to get those in our Q&A, feel free to put those in the comments section, regardless of whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. And uh, Shelby and team are currently working on uh, collating those questions right now. So feel free to put your questions in and we will get to the question and answer session in just a few moments. So uh, I had mentioned technology, Spencer, and for, for those like myself that are, are very uh, technically minded, I'm constantly thinking of, okay, is there a way to engineer a solution? Of course, a lot of it has to do with, with personal choice, and there are some tools that can help in, in that process. Of course, there's no, no, no magic wand, but uh, there are ways that we can uh, 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 help mitigate or lessen the, the impact uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, and, and I say technically minded, I did not say engineer, I, I leave that for people like you who really are, are bonafide, but 
could you talk a little bit about some of the uh, technology that uh, that folks like like yourself and others uh, in NOV have come up with to help in uh, in this effort? Absolutely. And this is kind of an area because you you say it's interest level. This is a passion of mine. Ah, there you go. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so technology is you're right. Is it's not a silver bullet. Um, if you have an issue, a, a, a challenge, bring an engineer and they'll they'll figure figure a way to fix it. Uh, it may not be the most cost effective <laughs> yeah, way, exactly. but we'll find a way to to get something out there. Um, we talked about what. You, know, you and I as an individual, what companies and foundations and governments can do, and this is kind of what the section here is going to be more about what NOV is doing, what our industry is doing. Um, a couple areas I'm going to talk about here is most of it ties back to that scope one as far as how our clients operate and providing technology to help them operate in a better way to reduce their emissions. Um, one of which, you know, NOV is known for... Um, rigs and drilling equipment and process equipment and uh, things that go into fracking operations. And the EFRAC, if we could take a look at the picture here, the EFRAC is a way to do that. Is It's a technology that is continuing the practices, but it's bringing best practices in place. So instead of having large diesel, ga or di diesel or gas generators on site, which are more difficult to control point source emissions on smaller generation equipment, this is actually bringing power to source where we're actually bringing power in and doing the same operation. So it's still fracking, but it's actually allowing the emissions to be handled at a power plant, which has emissions controls already in place. So on site and different locations, those are, those are contained um, by just a plug going into it. Um, same practices, same principles, but it's, it's giving the benefits there for emission space. Um, another one is in the power blade uh, technology. Uh, this one's particularly interesting. It's not necessarily new technology. You know, if you think of a flywheel, it's been used mm -hmm. since the times of water power production for milling operations where a very large mass is spinning mm -hmm. and it continues to spin even when there's fluctuations in wind for power or uh, water for power. Uh, in this type of technology, you basically have a motor spinning up when you have power or hydraulics spinning up when you have access to that, that power source. And then when you don't have the power, it's basically continuing to supply back through generation. Um, similar technology could be used for power, for wind. Uh, if you don't have wind, you don't have power. If you don't have solar, you don't have power from, from photovoltaics and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a continuance of supply. And what that does is instead of turning on a generator, instead of uh, ramping up or essentially taking an engine off of its you know, uh, perfect precision at 80 something percent and the lowest emissions point, it allows you to basically maintain that to where you pull power back in. Um, and similar technology is being looked at for uh, other spaces for energy in addition to this as well. Um, another area, we talk about carbon capture. Uh, if we can go to the, the next chart there for carbon capture. This one is, a little bit tricky because it's partly on scope one as far as how a facility operates, a power plant. Um, but when you start looking at the complexities of getting this in place is once you capture the carbon, what do you do with it? Where do you put it? And that starts opening up in interesting conversations on scope three, which was somebody's waste might actually be somebody's product. Mm -hmm. And EOR, for example, using CO2 to uh, essentially displace the hydrocarbons that are in reservoirs that carbon can actually be pushed in to continue to put out good products where instead of just having a lot of water go down and putting more power to basically get little bits out, that CO2 can displace and get more of the hydrocarbons out for products like our shirts and our clothes mm -hmm. and our, our cars and iPhones and everything else. Um, the scope three side comes in is that now you have to basically put in a pipeline. So you've got a pipeline operator. You also have to put into storage location or EOR facility. So now you're talking a marketplace that's basically being developed out of what was previously a waste that was just put in the atmosphere. Right. So when people hear scope one, what does that mean? Hopefully it gave a little bit. There's a lot more on uh, uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, if you look up the, the scope one, scope two, and the initiatives and things like that. Um, scope two is more in kind of when you hear people talk about renewable energy. That's mainly what's being focused on there. And we also have some in the, the solar power where we're looking at using solar power for um, living quarters on offshore facilities and using some uh, advanced tracker technology for that as well with an NOV. Mm -hmm. So 
Lots in this. Yeah. Uh, NOV's doing a lot, and we're most of it's on the, the Scope 1, but we'll be supporting others on the Scope 3 side there as well. And it's certainly very apparent to me uh, to hear the passion that you do have for for this space because ultimately uh, I'm sure it's very invigorating personally knowing that the efforts that you're working on aren't uh, isn't, isn't something that's just benefiting you. You're, you're helping, you know, you're, you're a piece of the the cog, so to speak, using your analogy earlier to help bring positive change uh, for the global environment for uh, us today and, and those uh, that are coming after us. So that's, that's really great. So I Definitely. appreciate that. Well, uh, I've enjoyed uh, talking with you, Spencer. I know that uh, folks are always wanting to uh, uh, find more information. Um, I know that we have information on our website. Um, actually, I'll go over to you, Shelby, so you can mm -hmm. uh, tell our folks a little bit about how they can get more information on uh, what NOV is doing, and then of course get to our, our Q&A as well. Yeah, absolutely. One of the best ways to find out what we're doing, um, as always, you can you can go to our website, www.nov.com, and we have a search feature. You can find all kinds of information there. Um, but if you want to go to a specific page that'll help you out, you can go to www.nov.com slash energy dash transition. So that will have all the information on, on what we're doing here to reduce emissions and to help um, people be better stewards of their emissions. And um, I'll, I'll kind of go from there right into the questions because we got some really excellent ones and I want to make sure we make room for, for everyone. But yeah, check us out on the website. Uh, for now, we're going to go to this first question from Lionel on LinkedIn. And he actually noticed something on that graph we had that was talking about the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. And he noticed right at the top right corner, there was a bit of a, of a dip in that concentration that happened to be in the year 2020. And he was wondering, is that by chance uh, due to the COVID-19 worldwide lockdowns or is it coincidence? Um, do you know anything about what that little dip there could be? Are, they, they notice everything, our audience. They're good, they're, they're sharp. Definitely not a coincidence. Um, <laughs> if you think back to 2020, there was a lot more remote officing taking place. Uh, there was a lot more uh, people staying at home, uh, a lot less air travel taking place. Um, if you're in the airline industry, that was not a good year for mm -hmm. you. Um, but when you look at what, what that experiment was, is it was a, a global experiment on what happens if we actually reduce our consumption in the terms of transportation, in the terms of consumption. Um, there was a lot to that. So definitely not a, um, a coincidence by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the challenge is this chart is not as updated as would like to show, but it's actually showing an uptick for 2021 as things open back up, as people start taking more trips and using their cars more and getting back in the office. So uh, it was very much a, uh, an inadvertent scientific experiment. <laughs> but great question. Yeah, maybe some good came out of, out of the yeah. lockdown. I really yeah. like that. Um, and then this next question, so we, you know, a lot of times people, how they respond to when you're talking about something new, like, or, you know, kind of a new a source, carbon capture, those things, they think we're trying to do away with I know you mentioned like the, the coal industry and stuff. So I want to ask more, what um, opportunity do we see? The, I know there's a lot of knowledge transfer to be had, um, a lot of transfer of the workforce, but could you talk a little bit about the opportunities that new, new things like this, new technologies pose? Sure, and kind of talking very broad sense, the, the new technologies are really trying not to limit what's available to people today. Um, there will likely need to be some conversations on reduction and you know overall consumerism and kind of what we're used to a, as a, a, a U.S. entity or you know kind of the 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 bigger spenders, the bigger consumers of the world. Um, but the core of the technology is really to continue to get energy into locations that are not able to get access to it. Um, there's conversations going on that it's not so much about a climate change; it's more about a an issue for uh, low-cost energy. Um, and when you talk about how, I forget the exact value, but it's, you know, it, it's almost a billion people in the world are still living without power, running water, access to, to basic things that you know, us on the call are, are probably taking for granted on a daily basis. So there's still a, a pretty big effort to go into that. And everything we do is really trying to make sure that we're not adding more cost than is absolutely necessary for these type of activities as well. Uh, but with complexity, oftentimes 
comes cost. Um, there's there's quite a few focuses going on to um, take the waste. You know, if we're taking CO2 from a gas stream, what do you do with it? Uh, can you turn it into aggregates? Can you turn it into other uh, components that can be used more productively? Um, taking methane and coal and turning it into other products that can be used more effectively. Uh, reforming methane, for example, is a, a technology to take uh, methane into hydrogen. Um, hydrogen combustion forms basically water. Um, the combustion of uh, methane and other gases has carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, uh, other things that come out that are more challenging, uh, NOx and SOx and other components from uh, carbon, carbon-based materials mm-hmm. and things as well. So the, the conversion is, is going to take place. It's going to be a, a function of how, how big of an appetite the world has for it. Um, carbon taxes, carbon incentives, uh, tax credits, all these things kind of play in from a regulation standpoint to try to drive some of these things. But uh, it's going to be a, a big effort to really get all that pulled together to see what the actual outcome can be, how it can be done, and how fast it can go as well. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Um, this next one I think is kind of a, a good uh, transition from that, which is when you consider the future of emissions and how the story will evolve, are there any bright spots or, or bits of hope, uh, lights at the end of the tunnel that you can foresee? Sure. Um, and like that response to the, the first question about 2020, you know, that experiment, uh, we know we can do it. Um, the efforts that are going on for converting gasoline and diesel-driven cars to electric vehicles, that's, again, not a silver bullet, but it's a way to reduce the number of point sources. So taking that back into power plants, which are much more cost-effectively controlled for emissions, and bringing that into a kilowatt going into a battery and driving down the road, you can imagine, if you think back to that uh, carbon capture plant, that's a 400,000 ton per year type of facility. Um, relative to the little car and the van there, you can imagine you're not just going to put that on every single vehicle or some part of it on every single vehicle. It's going to be very cost right. prohibitive. And then what do you do with the CO2? You need another storage tank. You got your battery or you have basically a gas tank and then you also have a, a CO2 handling tank with the compression. It just it becomes very challenging to do that level for an emission sense on a multi-point source. Um, so I think some of the efforts going on there are, you know, conversion from how the fuel is being used is definitely a, a bright source. Um, you know, if you think back, Elon Musk was considered crazy for starting Tesla. You know, it's not that far back in recent history that we look at. It's like, okay, maybe there is something there. And now we're looking at Ford coming out with their fancy uh, F-150 mm-hmm. that it can also power a, a building when hurricanes take place or when power mm-hmm. outages take place. So. The, the technology is, is definitely getting there where it's more readily available. Um, going back to, again, kind of, you know, glimmering hopes, um, there are lots of carbon capture projects going on. Um, some of them are not quite financially viable yet. Um, some of them are more introductory, more demonstration, but their power plants are going on. In fact, just south of town here, Petronova has a carbon capture facility on a, a coal burning facility. Um, that technology could be translated to other parts of the world. The technology exists. It's not new R&D. It's actual technology that is proven. Um, when you look into other spaces, advanced technology, you know, the biggest emissions, if you think back to transportation, we talked about electric vehicles. There's electric trucks are being talked about. There are active focuses going in for electric flying vehicles. Uh, It's going to be a big challenge to put that big of a battery pack up there, but uh, there's efforts going on there. Um, Electric boats for cargo is another area that's being looked at. Uh, The next one down there, if you remember back on that infographic, was the uh, power generation. And power generation is a big one, that if Mm -hmm. we can solve that and start shifting to electric vehicles, you don't get both without some trade-offs. So you need better power generation if you're going to have all these electric vehicles. If you're going to have more electric vehicles, you're going to need more power generation. So yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that merry-go-round, right? Which I, I know we've and we've had some folks on the show previously talking about uh, way, you know, but different ways to to solve that. Which, to your your earlier comment, will will ultimately take a, a collective uh, effort to to solve. So and uh, and yeah. power is another one too. Is you've know, had some other folks on here talking about nuclear, mm-hmm. right, right? Nuclear for a long time, still in many parts of the world, is a, a no-no. It's a bad word. But the reality is, is there's no carbon emissions that come from nuclear. 
um, kind of looking forward more interesting from a technology standpoint is fusion is starting to become a, an active mm -hmm. discussed word. Mm -hmm. It's not just a, you know, scientific. No, yeah, no, no sci-fi. Right, right. Well, right. It, it's, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's bringing it to earth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's actually uh, interesting you, you pointed that out because uh, earlier today we rebroadcasted an episode we did with Colonel Terry Virts who um, spent multiple trips on the International Space Station and, and he talked about nuclear energy as well and how much safer it is, but there's kind of that maybe stigma or people yeah. are scared of the word, yeah. but but really what a great resource that is. Um, we'll, we'll have time just for one more question here. A uh, great question came in on LinkedIn from Felix. And he was wondering if NOV is focused on or invested in any technologies uh, that will use or could use waste uh, from energy and convert it into healthy energy that won't be as harmful to the environment. So I'm going to assume he's talking about waste heat capture. And yes, there are, there are focuses that we're currently using waste heat. There are other focuses that will be looked at there. And that's part of the, the challenge is that when you look at converting from one thing to another, the reason the other isn't done isn't because it wasn't of interest or desire or, you know, in many cases, uh, technically not feasible. It was the economic drivers for that were such that it was easier to do, just put the CO2 in the atmosphere, what's the big deal? Um, but when you start talking about uh, compression, you start talking about uh, uh, heat sources like energy production, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's coal or methane or uh, other sources that are creating waste heat is it's really taking efficiencies out of every single possible point that can be taken. So if you have a uh, internal combustion engine being able to use the exhaust gas uh, to heat up, whether it's for a, a turbocharger or it's for other sources, um, at some point you get to a kind of point of diminishing returns where if you have 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it's, it's relatively easy to do a, a, a temperature difference and actually get some energy out of that or power out of that. As you start getting into a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes much more challenging, but there's still efforts can be done with that. In fact, there's uh, some references. I'm going to pick on sci-fi for a minute. Is If you think of, go back and look at any Star Wars movie, is any civilization was built up around something. Is It was either a mine, a power source, something that gave them the ability to go to get, get that facility put in place. But it's just like space exploration is, you know, you don't have all of the infrastructure in place. So you have to basically take everything out that you can. And also speaking back to Terry is when you're on a space station or even when you're sailing on a boat is you're very conscious of everything you put on that boat, everything you use on that boat, mm -hmm. and everything goes off that. Same thing for remote uh, col uh, co colonial civilizations and things like that, where you're going to use that last bit of heat for agricultural purposes. You know, if you only have two growing seasons, well, if you bring a greenhouse in and you use that last bit of heat, maybe you can get a third growing season. That makes your life quality better because you have food for the winter or your food for mm -hmm. the rest of the year. Um, similar things for energy conversion from waste heat is you can use the last little bits for preheating. You can use the last little bits for uh, post-combustion processing. Uh, the carbon, process, uh, carbon capture process has a lot of compression that goes in there. Well, you got waste heat from that. Uh, you also have expansion as you're starting to put that through uh, cryogenic processes or otherwise, at which point you need to add heat back in. So it's putting the balances in place to be able to use that. Um, whether you're talking about Stirling engines to use that last little bits, you know, they're, they're nice little toys on top of your computer to make a little right. animation move right. up and down. Uh, there's some challenges in making that widespread. Mm. Um, I expect, and I think this is probably where Terry's comments were earlier, is I expect to see more on small scale nuclear than on very low source or low heat uh, energy production mm. just because of the cost of things right. that go in there as well. Yeah, you mentioned Star Wars. I uh, I did spend a little bit of the pandemic watching all all of the Star Wars movies that have been produced so far. And uh, yeah, as as you were mentioning, I'm I'm thinking through like, okay, episode one, two, three. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. great observation. Yeah, that's a great, great like way to think about it. My ideal is that you've got a power source, and then you have a, a brewery right next to it using the, the remaining <laughs> heat to to heat up your right. mash or something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. So. If you're gonna do it, do it right. <laughs> right. That's right. And you know, I always love, uh, I'll be the first one to admit when I'm wrong because I said that was the last question. 
but there it's not it going to be. We got a really is. great one, and I can't help myself. I, I got to sure. get this question from our audience answered. Um, Graham on LinkedIn asked, with reference to CCUS, is it really a long-term solution? Hmm. That's a great question, because mm -hmm. if you think long-term, you know, when I mentioned long-term earlier, it was 50 million years. <laughs> right. um, yeah. Probably not in that sense. <laughs> um, Midterm, my definition earlier was 800,000 years. That's a lot of speculation to come. Mm -hmm. um, but if you start looking the next 30 to 50 years as a long term, you know, and I think, you know, normal financial models that most corporations use, that's probably short. That's probably long term planning mm -hmm. uh, for most corporations. I think it is. Um, the reason being is that the cost of hydrocarbon or fossil fuels is still at such a point that I don't expect to see it going away in our in our lifetimes definitely not in our careers. Um, that said is there is still going to be a shift towards renewable fuels um, or renewable energy sources. Uh, wind energy is great when the wind's blowing. Solar power is great when the sun's shining. Uh, batteries are interesting. Um, there's definitely new technology coming out. There's opportunities there. Um, if we think back to February and 2021 or of uh, uh, in Texas anyways with the the winter outage um, that was a wake-up call for a lot of people that you know, when you have snow on solar power or you have ice on solar power they mm -hmm. don't work right um, so needing some way to kind of weather the storms or to bridge those I still expect we're gonna see in our lifetimes the continuance of fossil fuels in that sense so it's a long-term 30 to 50 years Maybe it's not a long-term 150-year out there, um, but we still have sources of CO2. We still have sources of methane that are going to need to be captured and, and handled in some way, shape, or form as right. well. Right. So, so what I think I'm hearing is that you know when we're talking about uh, CCUS or, or really any other uh, uh, technology, that, that really it's part of a broader mix. You know that we're I don't know that we're necessarily or, or maybe I'm, that's what you're saying. Are you saying that? It's bi I don't think we're saying it's binary. I think we're saying that there's, there's maybe been a, a lar the larger piece of the pie that has been fossil fuels, and we're, we're trying to maybe to a certain degree rebalance or, or otherwise help use some of these technologies as a catalyst to reverse some of the impacts that, that we've seen. I think it's a good way to put it, because you don't get the solar powers from nothing. Right. You, you still have to have the hydrocarbons coming out of the ground to support that. Um, gas transmission uh, supports that as well. The energy uh, markets support that as well. So having a way to get to the ideal state, you don't just flip a switch and all of a sudden there's everything mm -hmm. amazing. There's no emissions from any of the energy sources that we're using. Um, our, our grid, our networks, our utilities would not function if they were just told tomorrow, okay, everything has to be 100% renewable. Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be a period of time. And these plants, uh, even the states, the legislatures, the governments that are supporting these facilities, you don't just build a plant for a couple of years. You build these coal plants for 30 to 50 years. You build nuclear plants for similar fashions as well. So it, there's going to be a, an interest to continue to take those. And in the sense of coal, is it's cheap. And that's going to be a big challenge if everybody goes to a renewable. And that's great when the power is there because the sun is shining. But as you turn off the sun, the batteries are expensive. So there's going to be a balance there of what makes sense. Um, but kind of going back to CCUS is CCUS itself, I should probably define carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, the carbon capture side is probably a longer term in some form or fashion. Utilization is starting to pick up. Storage is more where the current focuses are across the world. Um, so I, I see more of a shift in the general storage to more of a utilization to come than, say, in general, CCUS is a, a short-lived right. technology. Right. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I wanted to say thank you so much, Spencer, for answering our audience's questions. And, and thank you to everybody for submitting those questions. We always love to see um, those online. If you do think of any later, uh, no need to worry. We can still get those questions answered if you want to email them to socialmedia at NOV.com. Uh, we'll be sure to get you in touch with Spencer or at least try to get you um, as best an answer as we can. So um, there's, it's never too late to, to send in a great question. We love those. 
And before I um, hand it back over to Michael to close out the show, I did want to answer our Riggy question from earlier. So we're going to put that question one more time on the screen. And I did see somebody get the correct answer. If, if you don't want to Google it or if you don't know it, you can scroll up real fast. Uh, but the question was, what is the name of the female scientist who predicted the eff eff effects of greenhouse gases? And the answer to that is Eunice Foote. So um, congrats to the person who got it correct on LinkedIn. And thank you, everybody, for, um, again, submitting those questions and for participating on today's show. We appreciate it so much. All right. You, thank you, Shelby. Really appreciate it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Spencer, uh, you, you gave me the, yeah, you gave me the signal. Yeah. <laughs> just before you close out, I wanted to kind of just mention one thing to the audience and hopefully those that view this later is if there's one thing you can do, just look at doing something. Mm. You know, if it's, you know, considering not driving that, you know, five miles for something when you can do it the next day, um, when it's turning off a light switch, you know, those little things, they, they seem small, but if you think of seven billion people across the world, they definitely add up. Right. And little things can mean a lot in the grand scheme of things. And same thing when, when you're talking about a billion dollar carbon capture facility is doing something, doing the study, getting uh, in, in contact with us, asking the questions, you know, helping us guide them through what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Just ask the question. Don't don't ignore it. Don't uh, think that it doesn't make sense as we'd be happy to kind of help things through, whether it's on a technology side or uh, giving references to, of what you an individual can do or what you as a company can do as well. Mm. Do something. Sounds like a good uh, Spencer Ullman bumper sticker. Do Maybe, something. Yeah, there we go. All right, well, I appreciate you joining us, Spencer, and uh, appreciate it. All of our uh, guests joining us online for today's conversation. Uh, as always, you can reach us uh, many different ways. One of those is innov.com, and you can search in the search bar in the upper right-hand corner for many of the solutions and technologies we talked about today. So our guest was Spencer Ullman, Director of Innovation here at PFT. Uh, on the social media desk was Shelby Dumain. Uh, production team was Paul Dufio and Weihan Lin. I'm Michael Gaines, and on behalf of all of us here at NOV, thanks for watching and for listening. We'll talk to you again next time.